I'm Jerry Barnett. I'm a campaigner for free expression and sexual freedom and a writer on science, sex, censorship and identity politics. I'm the author of a book called Porn Panic, which looks at the history of feminism as an authoritarian pro-censorship movement. So here I am at a men's conference with a talk entitled Too Many Men. I accept that this isn't a good way to win friends and influence people, but in many ways this statement is true. I'm going to look at how sexual strategies first evolved in humans and how these led to the various gender gaps we see today. Finally, I'll look at whether there's a way forward that can help close gender gaps and lead us to a happier place. So when I talk about gender gaps, I'm talking about some things that disadvantage men and others that disadvantage women. It's undeniable that women suffer much higher levels of sexual violence than men, and equally true that men suffer higher murder rates, are more likely to commit suicide, are more likely to end up in prison, or get shot by police, and so on. These differences are all rooted in human biology, but this doesn't mean they can't be resolved. However, we can't begin to improve things for either men or women if we buy into junk explanations. It would be nice to think that male and female behavior differences are socially constructed, so all we have to do is learn to think differently and shazam, everything is fixed. But this isn't true. The essence of male and female behavioral differences is rooted in millions of years of evolution as well as thousands of years of civilization. We need to understand our origins as a species if we're going to make life better for our sons and daughters. I'll point out that I'm very much a progressive and an optimist in my thinking. History shows us that whenever society has, has hit bumps in the road, it has evolved to find workarounds and move forward again. This means that I don't generally buy conservative viewpoints that rely on trying to turn back the clock to a better time. This is for two reasons. First, the old solutions often don't work a second time around. And second, because generally we look back with rose-tinted glasses and tend to imagine that the past was better than it actually was. The past always contains valuable lessons, but the conservative instinct to go back is generally misguided. At the root of everything is the sex trade. Everyone instinctively understands that the trade of sex is not and can never be an equal thing. The fact that Female sex is clearly a more valuable commodity than male sex is fixed by our biology, not by social trends. To explain this, I'm going to take a look into, um, into science and look at how sex evolved and how it shaped humans. The primary purpose of every living thing is to protect and reproduce its genes. That's why we tend to protect our children and our siblings so fiercely. And it's also, of course, why we're so damn interested in sex. The original simple asexual mode of reproduction meant that individuals simply created identical copies of themselves. Sexual reproduction was a revolution that took place a billion or so years ago in which two individuals would cooperate in reproduction and the offspring would contain a mix of genes from both parents. The benefit of this is that it created far more diversity in each species. Instead of making endless identical copies, sexual reproduction makes um, individuals um, which are unique. So sexual species split into two varieties which we call male and female. In sexual reproduction each side produces, provides reproductive cells known as gametes. So in humans for example there are sperm and eggs. In the early stages there wouldn't have been any great difference between the sexes, they were equivalent. So you just needed one of each to reproduce. If there was any differentiation it would have just been so that they could recognize each other. But over time, one sex, let's call it sex A, evolved a lazy strategy of creating more but smaller gametes. This was a good trick because the more gametes you can make, the more offspring you can produce. The problem was that gametes don't just contain genes, they also contain nutrition to start the new creature, to give the new creature a start in life. So sex A's gametes got smaller and smaller, and as that happened, sex B was forced to compensate by making its gametes bigger, which meant that sex B had to invest more in reproduction than sex A. Now, obviously, sex A is what we call males, and sex B is what we call females. So the fundamental difference between males and females in all sexual species, not just humans, is that males are low investors in reproduction, and females are high investors. That's what defines the sexes, essentially. And it's important to understand that the, this, the, the sexes are essentially defined by economics, the level of investment that they put into making babies. So sex is very much, and always has been, an economic activity. 
Now, this difference is obvious in humans. You can hardly compare the efforts involved in ejaculation with the cost of pregnancy and breastfeeding. And this holds true everywhere. Females invest far more in reproduction than males. The reason people get hay fever, for example, is that male trees and grasses fill the air with billions of gametes, which we call pollen. That's the male job done. It's the female that receives the pollen and produces seeds. And since seeds are high in nutrition, it's the female's job to give up valuable energy to ensure that the seedlings survive. Females get the short straw in reproduction. So to an extent, we can, all, we can blame um, all gender balances, all gender imbalances in all species on our ancient male ancestors who hundreds of millions of years ago evolved the trick of being lazy and letting the females do the hard work in reproduction. But of course females fought back, at least in evolutionary terms. If they were going to do the hard work in reproduction, then the males would pay in some other way. The fundamental problem in most species was the same. There were more males than the population needed. There were too many males. So big differences began to emerge between male and female behaviours. There's no universal law to say how males and females should differ, but different species have come up with, uh, with a wide variety of different answers. So, for example, in many spiders, males are much smaller than females and often pay for mating by being eaten by their mate. In birds, the females often select the most glamorous-looking males, which means that in many bird species, the males are far more decorated than the females. In the case of peacocks, this sexual selection led to males growing outrageously big tails. This comes at a big cost. It makes male peacocks easier for predators to catch. But without the grand tail, no male peacock will mate. For all male creatures, from spiders to peacocks, it's better to mate and die young than to live a long life and die without reproducing. In many mammals, males compete violently for the right to compete. In species like lions or gorillas, males are far bigger and stronger than the females for this reason. Females don't play a big role in selection. They simply wait for dominant males to emerge. At some point in the past, human mating was probably similar to this. Studies on male skulls in humans have found that they appear to have evolved specifically to take a punch. Male skulls are stronger than female ones, suggesting that our, in our distant past, men were far more likely to experience serious violence than women. The, the likelihood is that most violence was in competition for mates. But at some point, human mating strategy changed, and this fundamentally changed our species. It should be obvious that humans aren't natural predators. We have none of what it takes to be a predator. We don't have claws, sharp teeth, we run slowly, and we're pretty weak. And yet, paradoxically, we have a real liking for meat. Meat is ultra-nutritious, packed with protein and energy. In our primitive past, fresh meat would have been a rare prize indeed. But before humans underwent the, the huge cognitive leap, known as the Great Leap Forward, the only decent meat we would have found would have been scraps left behind by lions and hyenas. One of our early uses of tools would have been to employ stones to break open bones so we could eat marrow and brains. But as our ancestors evolved the intelligence necessary to make tools, we became hunters and we started to get meat in our diet. There's a big question about why we started hunting, because although it seems obvious, it actually isn't. Of course, hunting introduced more meat and fat into our diet, and fat is especially important when you're a species with a big brain. But hunting carries huge costs and risks. Men might hunt for days without catching anything, so the return on energy isn't anything like as good as it might seem. Africa, where we all began, isn't the best environment for hunters. A lot of African game is big and dangerous, and men could easily get injured or killed in a hunt. My cat has joined me. <clears throat> there were safe and easy ways to get protein in a diet, from har harvesting insects, spiders, shellfish, worms, and so on. So in fact, the leap to hunting didn't make the same sense back then that it might seem now to us people who take for granted that meat is a key part of our diet. When we were so clearly not equipped to hunt, and when we so clearly didn't need to do it, why did we become hunters? The anthropologist and author Jared Diamond studied this point in hunter-gatherer cultures around the world and wrote an essay called Why Do Men Hunt? His answer was that men hunt because meat is a valuable commodity that can be traded for sex. Men expended energy and took risks in hunting exactly because meat was hard to get, and so it gave an edge to the best hunters. 
For women, it clearly made sense to trade sex for meat, which is probably, was probably the most valuable commodity in the early human economy. What this did was to ensure that the best hunters would have the most children. It also meant that men who opted out of hunting because they were risk averse or less physically able or whatever would not be as successful in mating as the hunters. The trade of sex for food wasn't at all unusual in the animal kingdom. It exists in many species of mammal, birds and even insects. But at this point in our history, this sexual select selection drove human evolution forwards. Good hunters had to be strong, fast, agile, good climbers and good throwers. But they also had to be good at innovation and other cognitive skills like teamwork. Female selection of the best hunters was likely a big contributor in the evolution of the modern human brain. So the human economy was born, and it was split into two types of industries. Women owned the sex industries, and men developed the other industries, hunting, fishing, and so on, that would yield products that could be traded for sex. Just as male technologies evolved, so did mating strategies. The development of simple verbal contracts meant that marriage began to, began, began to replace simpler forms of sex commerce. Marriage evolved as an, uh, uh, as an evolution of sexual commerce. It was a trade in which women ex offered exclusive mating in exchange for long-term support. This offered men a guarantee of paternity that they were father of their, of their children. For women, uh, marriage was a great prize, economically equivalent of leaving the gig economy for a long-term contract. But if the mating game created winners and losers among men before, now it became even more unfair. If the ultimate prize for women was a rich husband, and women were only allowed to marry one man, then the rich men would monopolize the available women. As private property began to accumulate in fewer and fewer male hands, so did the right to mate. Genetic evidence suggests that in the Middle East, only about 5% of men were mating, um, at least in the ancient Middle East, that is. The most successful man, man on record, at least from a mating perspective, was the Moroccan Sultan Moulay Ismail Ben Sharif, who fathered at least 867 children, and probably a lot more than that. There were far too many men, and those men that didn't have mates or children to support were a problem for society, and re were responsible for most of the violence and unrest. A solution was found in the invention of social monogamy, a system enforced by stigmatizing women for chasing married men, what now tends to be referred to as slut-shaming. This slut-shaming was not just enforced by men, but just as much by women, wives for, who that, for whom their husband was their economic base and who jealously guarded him from younger predatory women who might try to steal him. This created what's known sometimes as the whorearchy, a pecking order within the sex trade in which wives were at the top and then mistresses and then prostitutes. And down at the, mo the bottom of the, 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 the tree, liberated promiscuous women who gave sex away for free, undermining the whole sexual marketplace and decreasing the value of sex. Monogamy spread slowly across Eurasia and then was carried globally by the empires of Europe. As societies adopted it, they engaged more men in economic activity and as a result became less violent and more economically productive. So it's worth noting a couple of things. First, that monogamy doesn't come very naturally to humans. Second, that in the past, monogamy made society a less violent and safer place. It was the ero an erosion of the power of both of rich men and of women in general. But its enforcement relied heavily on shaming women who had sex outside wedlock, and especially those who became pregnant. So once the pill and abortion gave women control over their fertility, it was inevitable that the system would begin to crumble. And indeed, that's what's now happening. American statistics suggest that a decade ago, less than 10% of men were celibate. Now that number has rocketed to almost 30%. This is a seismic change, and it looks like a return to ancient times when women competed for the best-looking and wealthiest men and had little interest in mating with anyone else. Apps like Tinder have apparently opened up the sexual marketplace, but the reality is that, <clears throat> as in ancient times, a minority of men are sharing the majority of women. Experiments on Tinder show that men swipe more than 15 times more than women before finding a match. This is causing rising dissatisfaction, both among the neglected men and among women who cannot find a suitable partner or suitable partner who wants to settle down. If history is a guide, society is going to become more and more violent and divided. In fact, if today is a guide, that's already happening. 
some people, especially religious conservatives and notably the psychologist Jordan Peterson, have suggested that a return to socially enforced monogamy is the solution to all this. As a liberal, I disagree. To return to those times would require a deeply authoritarian regime. It should also be pointed out that the old ways were not necessarily happier ways. So what is the solution? How do we preserve individual liberty and fix the sexual imbalance? Unfortunately, there's no pretty answer to that. Human biology is still human biology. We're still left with the eternal problem. There are too many men, and there always have been. Men will always value sex more highly than women do. Technology has at least helped to alleviate, to alleviate fr sexual frustration. Pornography, although it's often presented as the villain, has perhaps been the savior. The availability of free porn has correlated with a steep decline in sexual violence. It's also the case that in the past, people pursued sex because there, were li there was little else to occupy us. There's no, that's no longer the case. We live in a golden age of entertainment, from gaming to movies and infinite music on tap. Sex work helps fill the void and is becoming more mainstream than ever, whether we're in the form of escorting, sugar babies or webcam. It's also becoming cheaper than ever, and this is the result of the decreasing stigma around sex work. The less stigma there is, the more accessible sex becomes. The, logic, the logical endpoint is that, with, as with so many other things in the global marketplace, sex becomes cheap enough that anyone can afford it on a regular basis. And finally, technology can step in in the form of immersive sex, uh, virtual world, worlds, sorry, immersive virtual worlds and sex robots. These play a wide role in making sex more widely and easily available on demand. They may not be perfect, these may not be perfect solutions, but there probably is no perfect solution. This doesn't help answer the question of how anyone, male or female, can find love, marriage, and have a family. And maybe there is no answer to that. It may be that these things are going to become increasingly rare. But it's a good thing, not a bad thing, that we can start to separate sex from relationships. If sex is easily available, then we might st instead start to form more lasting and fulfilling platonic relationships that are free from the heartaches of romance. Rather than try to pursue, pursue life as our ancestors lived it, perhaps it's more productive to look forward and reinvent relationships in a way that removes inequality and unfairness for everyone.